Sustainability, the Potsdam Dialogues, science for a safe tomorrow. Six of ten uh, biggest UN peace uh, operations were in countries ranked as the most strongly exposed to climate change. In 2020, we saw 75% of new displacements were all due to flooding and droughts in Somalia. We need to realize that it is a, an emergency that's happening. The international security community is increasingly concerned about the climate-related risks to peace and security. 216 million. This is the number of people climate change could push to leave their homes by 2050 unless urgent action is taken. These are the numbers from the latest World Bank report from September 2021. And if there are still doubts about our changing climate, let's just quickly remind ourselves of the last few years. So last year alone, we've seen flooding and heat waves in Europe. There were massive fires and a record heat in Arctic Siberia. We have had three years of drought in Kenya and Ethiopia in a row, intense floods and landslides in India and Nepal. Especially for already stressed out regions, climate change means additional pressure. It means people needing to flee the place they grew up and possibly never return. Why that is, how climate change drives migration, displacement and even conflict is the focus of today's sustainability podcast. And I'm actually very honored we got two experts in the field discussing these extremely important topics with us. So, first of all, I'm very glad Barbara Zedova is joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Barbara co-leads the Future Lab Security, Ethnic Conflicts and Migration at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Barbara is also co-lead of the Weathering Risk Project. That's an initiative that aims to identify and address climate change-related security risk. Her research focus is on climate change impacts on migration, displacement and conflict. Our second guest for today is a bit further away. Chris Hodder joins our podcast from East Africa. Since June 2020, he is the first UN climate security and environmental advisor to Somalia, where he works within the framework of a UN peace mission. Chris has a public health background and spent most of his career in fragile and developing countries. For example, in Congo and Chad, where he worked for the Médecins Sans Frontières, or in Nepal, where he supported the local government. Welcome, Chris. Great, thank you. Very happy to be here and look forward to this discussion. Okay, great. Very first question goes to you, Chris. So when I was looking for a suitable climate security practitioner in the field, I found you very quickly, which is great. But I also found it a bit difficult to really understand what you do as the first UN climate security and environmental advisor to Somalia. So what does this actually mean? What do you do? Well, so thank you. That's a, that's a really great question. And actually, I'm not 100% sure myself. Um, but no, I, I, uh, I am um, the sort of guinea pig, as it were, sort of cross between a guinea pig and a bit of a sort of poster boy. So maybe it's a sort of poster guinea pig of some sort um, around what climate security is. And so really, my role is sort of threefold. One, it's around uh, looking at um, peace building just broadly and how do we make peace building more climate sensitive and so I work a lot on issues around uh, environmental mediation I work a lot around you know building uh, capacities and supporting rule of law institutions like the police like the military like the maritime authorities um, but also looking at uh, you know climate dis uh, diplomacy transboundary issues uh, such as water, such as displacement and things like that. So that's one side of it. My second uh, sort of, or the second part of this is a re really around how do we make adaptation and mitigation more conflict sensitive? So the first one is how do you make, how do you make conflict more climate sensitive? And the second one is how do you make um, climate more conflict sensitive? And so I work a lot on the coordination aspects of the environmental approaches. So how do we bring the nexus teams together? So like, um, you know, humanitarian development and peace actors, specifically on things like the drought now or the flooding and these increased climate impacts that we're seeing, how do we bring them all together? And my third sort of aspect is, uh, is around building the system. So that's 
working on uh, how do you build the government capacities, how do you build uh, the local government, how do you build um, uh, resilience to climate change at the community level through institution building. And then also, how do we look at uh, reducing our own footprint? So I focus also on supporting the UN's reduction of our own footprint in Somalia. So definitely a work with huge responsibilities on different levels, from supporting the local farmer to government institutions. So very complex, it seems. Now over to you, Barbara. You assess climate change, migration and conflict from a more scientific perspective. Can you give us some insight into your research? Yeah, sure. Um, as you already pointed out, um, in my work, I mostly look into data and um, analyze different data sources, uh, such as um, climate-related information, migration information, displacement, and so on, and try to explain what I see in my um, analysis using um, theories from uh, migration studies, from economics, and so on. Um, yeah, and uh, more specifically, I uh, look into the direct and higher order effects of uh, climate impacts and how they affect migration, especially in low and middle income countries. And um, how are these dynamics linked to um, conflicts and other security risks? And um, here, what I mean by um, higher order effects is that um, they are more indirect and um, result from existing economic dependencies. Very interesting to see these different ways to look at climate migration. So Barbara, more from a data-driven research point of view, and Chris, who is working directly at site. And what I would be keen to know now is what exactly is climate migration from your expert view? So I would feel the popular image is where are the poor people in poor regions like Africa or Central and South America migrating to other richer parts of the world, such as Europe or the US? Does this view hold? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's an aspect, there's an aspect about climate migration um, that is to do with, um, you know, people seeking um, uh, different and alternative uh, options and livelihoods. So what we what we're seeing in Somalia is that you know of the 2.6 million people, there's a large amount. And in 2020, we saw 75% of of um, of new displacements um, were all due to flooding and drought. So we know that displacement is becoming very very um, you know very 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 bad. And I think that what we need to do is that we see that um, international migration. Um, and the increase in population, especially from, um, you know, uh, sub-Saharan countries where youth and population increases is happening at a, a large rate, that we will see this as an international security risk, risk as well in terms of large migrations of population moving to other areas where they can gain um, more access to, to, to equal opportunities. 75% displacement due to flooding and droughts that sounds really terrible where do they go once they are displaced so where can they actually go what are the options yeah so there's the, the, there is a big movement of population in in the region so obviously the borders are very fairly porous between ethiopia between kenya and other places but there's also quite a big movement to yemen and there's quite a big um, sort of movement also towards Europe and, and North Africa as well. So there is um, movement, but there's also movement in Somalia. So there's a big movement towards urbanization. So if we were to look on the, you know, sort of current uh, rate of um, growth and current rate of urbanization, um, by 2080, we predict somewhere between 30 to 40 million people being uh, in urban environments and usually probably in the coastal urban environments in Somalia. And often with the lack of infrastructure and the lack of, um, you know, uh, sort of ability for these urban environments to cope, there will be more of a migration to other countries that would, you know, be able to offer those sort of alternate options. All right. So my first takeaway would then be that the typical image about displaced people all moving to richer regions is not quite the full picture. But people who have lost their homes would first try to move to urban areas within their country. Um, Barbara, what is what is your take on this? I think you're right, Juliana, that uh, climate migration has uh, often been framed as a looming international security threat. And um, indeed, it has been shown that uh, 
um, direct and higher order effects of climate may trigger international displacement. The Syrian crisis uh, serves as a great uh, demonstration um, of these dynamics where, this, the, where it, the crisis had been linked to major droughts, which have added uh, yet another layer of pressure to already vulnerable socioeconomic and political situation, which then resulted in a violent conflict. And as a result, international displacement from Syria towards Europe took place. So basically, Syria and its people were already in danger because of the political crisis. And then climate change amplified this and further paved the way to the terrible war then forcing Syrians to leave their home and their country, right? Yeah, so to sum up, uh, under some circumstances, um, climate-related pressures uh, can contribute uh, to, to international migration and to displacement via conflict, uh, but the association is very context-dependent, um, which often falls under the table when discussed. And... Um, What I think it's important to note, and uh, I think Christoph already touched upon this, um, that most of the climate migration takes place, um, at least this is what the data shows, right? Uh, that most of the climate migration so far takes place uh, in low and middle income countries, uh, from rural to urban areas. So um, climatic pressure serves as an uh, additional driver of urbanization. And um, yeah, and most of the movement happens within countries' borders or uh, between neighboring countries. And um, in this context, migration has uh, for a long time, so in, in lower and middle income countries, migration has for a long time served uh, households as an important livelihood and risk management strategy. And um, in a changing climate, it obviously is uh, increasingly becoming more important. And if it is not managed well, it can. Um, It can be a risk, um, but it, if it's managed well, it can be um, very um, beneficial uh, for, for everyone involved. Okay, this might need some explanation now. Like how exactly could migration or has already been beneficial or could be a risk management strategy? So, for example, if um, cities are well prepared for uh, to absorb migrants into their housing and labor markets, uh, then... Uh, then there wouldn't be any increased uh, competition for resources and uh, the overall um, benefits uh, of climate migration could be, uh, or of migration could be, you know, like welfare enhancing also for, for the households uh, or household members at left uh, at the origin. So for instance, remittances uh, play an important uh, role for households livelihood strategy um, strategies. So, so therefore, I think um, the essential aspect is uh, to ensure that uh, climate migration uh, becomes a successful um, strategy um, and could help, you know, uh, increase welfare of uh, everyone who is directly or indirectly affected. Um, and therefore, research which improves the knowledge of climate migrant fl flows can help decision makers to better prepare for, for, for it and make it overall successful and beneficial. Um, it's an interesting point that Barbara is raising. And one of the things that we found quite interesting, we did a study on maladaptation techniques of people displaced. And actually we found that, um, we actually found that there's quite a lot of um, uh, pieces of, um, you know, uh, research that shows that often when someone displaces due to climate, um, they often, uh, their maladaptation techniques are often around cutting down trees uh, as their energy needs. And what happens is that when you cut down a tree, you then contribute to the, uh, the desertification and, the, and then the, um, you then contribute to the whole issue of desertification and further environmental degradation. And so um, I totally agree with um, Barbara that we need to think around urban environments, but I think also part of the issue that we're seeing is, is that, you know, often displaced populations often leave, and what we found in this study, were interesting, were the people that are displaced with conflict, due to conflict, often moved with their livestock or their livelihoods, or they could come back to it, whereas often climate displaced populations may have gone through several conflict displacement or may have gone through several cycles of bad weathers, but actually they displaced at the last time with almost nothing and they often can't go back. So there is actually a debate here about whether it is climate displacement or whether it's urbanization. Um, and then, so there's two issues there, the maladaptation around 
um, the environmental degradation, and then this issue of, you know, go, they can't go back because the land is so degraded that they just cannot do their livestock or livelihood anymore. I have a qu quick question on Chris. Um, so, uh, Chris, would you say that um, from what you see on the ground, um, city, cities uh, or urban areas are the new frontier where um, sort of uh, displacement meets uh, or climate related displacement meets uh, conflict? So is, is due to displacement conflict likelihood increasing uh, in urban areas? Yes, um, yes. I mean, we're, we're seeing um, increases in competition over natural resources in the rural areas increasing. So that's a definite, um, you know, we're tracking several conflicts and seeing that the, the, the community dynamics and the conflicts at the community level between clans is definitely, um, we can see that increasing over, over the grazing lands and water, but we can also see it in urban environments. And so, um, fortunately, a lot of the urban, or some of the major urban environments are controlled and supported by the federal government um, but there is still uh, conflicts happening and, and in increases in tension in urban environments um, specifically over water what we saw in 2017 um, drought was in one city in Baidu there just wasn't enough water um, underground to deal with the massive influx in populations. So actually a lot of the, the wells were, dry, were, were, um, were running dry. So there was a big, there was a big issue around that. And, um, and so there was a competition over that happening. And that, that is, uh, that's definitely the sort of things that we're seeing increasing from the urban perspective. So just to quickly recap, Chris explained the almost vicious circle of climate change leading to conflict, leading to people needing to flee their homes to move somewhere else. This then leads to degraded lands when people cut trees, for example, for their energy needs. And this, in turn, makes climate change even worse. We also talked about conflicts. There are more conflicts in rural and urban areas over natural resources, especially water. Now, let's dig a bit deeper and get to the question of How does climate change exactly trigger the risk of conflicts? Barbara, what is your take on that? The scientific evidence shows that uh, climate change or climatic pressures, uh, pressure is not a direct cause of conflict. Um, however, changing climate exacerbates drivers of conflict by increasing competition over natural resources, as Chris mentioned, by undermining livelihoods, forcing people to migrate or displacing them increasing food prices and contributing to food insecurity, to name just a few. And um, this can be also emphasized by, a re by recent statistics uh, reported by the Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, which finds that as of December 2020, six of 10 uh, biggest UN peace uh, operations were in countries ranked as the most strongly exposed to climate change. As mentioned earlier, conflicts is very context dependent and um, as an example I come back to to the human migration case um, as such human migration is uh, is not a risk but um, rapid and unmanaged uh, migration flows uh, insufficient support in receiving areas which experience pressures uh, on their resources or even policies that marginalize migrants can lead to unrests um, and tensions so climate change makes conflict more likely, but it always depends on the specific context. And Chris, you already talked about displacement happening due to climate change in Somalia. What about conflicts? Can you elaborate a bit more on this? What are you seeing on the ground? Yeah, I mean, exactly. We can, uh, we, we can see already that there's a lot of displacement going on because of climate change, so flooding and drought. We're in a, a very, very severe drought at the moment with almost, um, you know, almost half the population that cannot meet their daily food needs. Um, and probably around, you know, two, two million people that are in a very high level of the food insecurity. Um, so we know that a lot of this is linked to the drought. Um, we can't directly make any links between climate change and the drought, but we can see that the frequency of these are getting quicker and quicker. And we also see that, you know, flooding's happening every every two or three years now as well. So the, the erratic, rainfall and weather happen, are happening, but we can also see increasing in, in, in temperatures as well, average mean temperatures. But on the ground, what are we seeing? We're seeing like, 
you know, militant groups um, uh, breaking riverbanks as part of control mechanisms. Um, we are, you know, they then provide services um, and they're also taxing things like charcoal and other things as part of their revenue collection. So really using natural resources as a, as a key part of that. But what we're also seeing is, is that, you know, we need to pivot on the security side and the military and the, and the, and the maritime police side to really think around environmental protection, which is one thing we're really looking at, like how do you protect those riverbanks and how do we protect the water wells and the water resources, because that's where often the militant groups take over. So we're also seeing, you know, this deforestation. So in certain areas in Jubaland, we've seen up to a 70% reduction in tree cover um, in the areas that we're studying. So there is really uh, this cycle of, you know, conflict, displacement, um, climate uh, that is augmenting that, that's leading the displacement and more and more, you know, droughts and impacts. And then because the systems are so fragile, it's incredibly difficult for, you know, organizations such as the UN and the federal government and everyone to really deliver services. And that's where, mm -hmm. you know, the, the ownership or the fight over the humanitarian aid, as well as the delivery of services from, um, from organizations such as military, militant groups, they are gaining power and that's where we really need to think around this whole concept of climate mainstreaming within our security and uh, and also humanitarian provisions. Indeed. So we need to think about the connection between conflict, displacement and climate change. And we need to include it or we need to address climate security and climate security risk on an international scale. So how do we do this? I believe that um, it is important to create a mutually reinforcing path to a more peaceful world in a changing climate. Climate and security interactions should be an integral part of both climate action and foreign and security policy. And um, yeah, so to pre prevent conflicts, climate adaptation and mitigation should be designed in a conflict sensitive manner and simultaneously conflict prevention and peace building activities should consider climate change uh, um, as a potential risks. Um, also development cooperation should uh, go hand in hand with conflict pre prevention and climate action since security risks um, can only be decreased if we strengthen the resilience of the affected populations. And um, to better link these areas requires uh, engaging in an inclusive multilateral action, which brings on board all relevant actors. Um, there's still a long way to go. Uh, so, for example, during the climate negotiations uh, last year at the COP26 in Glasgow, climate security nexus was not an official agenda item uh, for the delegates. Um, nevertheless, there were several side events on climate security, some organized uh, even by Potsdam Institute or, or by PIC, by us. Um, in addition, for the first time, uh, the uh, NATO attended um, the climate security negotiations at the COP last year. So these are good signals that international security community is increasingly concerned about the climate related risks to peace and security. Yeah, and just and just to add to that, thanks, Barbara. I think that um, I think you're right, and I think that we should really put it on the agenda for COP27, um, specifically being in, in on the African soil. So I think that there's a there's a real big strong push for discussion around what does it mean. But what I feel like is we we are stuck still a bit in the international discussions around climate security risk, and what we really need to do is implement some really strong programs on the ground. Yes, talking about programs on the ground, which kind of programs for Somalia have already been kicked off or maybe even successfully delivered? Examples of these are really what I was talking about, this nexus approach, so bringing humanitarian development peace actors together. For example, what we're doing in Somalia is we, we brought FAO together, who were doing some sort of more medium to longer term bank stabilization programs on the river Shabele with OCHA and some humanitarian organizations that were doing sandbagging. And we brought some um, peace actors that were doing some stabilization on the, on the with the communities. And we really focused together to uh, come up with the sort of short, medium, longer term interventions on the river around what needs to focus. Hopefully that's an example of bringing this nexus to really reduce the impact of the flooding. And Barbara, how could your research help to prevent conflicts and improve day-to-day -day cooperation? I'm hinting now a bit at the Weathering Risk Initiative that I mentioned in the beginning. Can you explain what this project is all about? 
So um, the Veteran Risk Initiative is a three-year uh, project. It started last year, and um, it is led by um, uh, Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research uh, and uh, Adelphi, uh, and is conducted in, uh, in a close collaboration with the German Federal Foreign Office. The goal of the Veteran Risk Initiative is to um, is to improve the understanding of climate-related security risks, um, to enhance anticipatory tools or to improve anticipatory tools with climate sensitivity. And um, to this end, um, we have developed a multi-method approach to assess climate-related peace and security risks. We share this method um, and uh, the necessary tools uh, for assessment uh, on our website so that uh, stakeholders who are interested in to undertake such an assessment independently can uh, really um, draw on it. And we also uh, test the approach um, that we have developed in pilot regions, um, including Mali uh, and Somalia and Pacific Islands. And um, this allows uh, us to then identify um, context-specific um, tailor-made uh, recommendations for relevant decision makers um, in order to um, sort of um, mitigate or avoid uh, risks to peace and security uh, from climate change. Two very interesting examples of how the both of you contribute to help prevent conflicts with Nexus and the Weathering Risk Initiative. Still, this one sentence Chris mentioned earlier is still in my mind. They can't go back when moving due to climate change. But you, Barbara, also mentioned that migration does not always have to be a risk, but could also be an opportunity for remittances, meaning migrants sending back money home. So um, we've touched upon this already a bit, but Barbara, could you share your key insights with our audience? Sure, especially in low and middle income countries, migration and remittances are very important for households' livelihoods and uh, will become increasingly so in the future due to climate change. And um, the decisive factor is that uh, for whether migration becomes a risk or, or not is um, how well it is managed and uh, whether in the end uh, it is successful in terms of uh, whether migrants, for example, find jobs and uh, housing at the at the destination um, so that they can for example send home remittances so well-managed migration with focus for in, uh, focus on urban resilience um, um, should be a priority of, of the decision makers however also for europe international migration uh, can be and should be desirable um, there is uh, ample evidence that uh, inflows of migrants and asylum seekers are overall beneficial for European economy, even after accounting for the initial increase in public spending. And um, moreover, migration could also help to, to address a lot of uh, challenges that Europe will fa face, for instance, uh, such as the demographic challenges of an aging population. So policymakers should be interested in providing um, ample legal avenues for, for entering European Union and uh, facilitating uh, migrants integration. The only, the only question I have around it, and I think you're absolutely right, I think um, prioritizing our resilience, I think making sure um, that we have uh, the structures in place, and then that leads on to green growth and green jobs. So I totally agree with that. My only concern is, is often um, one thing is one is in fragile countries and fragile straits, there is um, a lack of, um, you know, resources to really drive that. Um, that's one. And then the second issue I have is that, um, you know, at some point uh, we need land for food and 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 production of um, livelihoods. And so the problem is, is that the land is getting degraded because of the movement and also because of climate change. And so really, is 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 the resilience of cities actually, um, you know, is that really the priorities? Because actually, in some ways, we should be investing into things like the Great Green Wall Initiative, we should be thinking about rewilding and regeneration approaches. I think that part of the issue is that we need to think about this in terms of population growth. We need to think about the fact that by 2080, we're going to see a, you know, doubling in size of population as well as urban growth. So 
I, I, I agree with you, but I think that we also need to think about rewilding and regeneration as part of the solution, not just urban side. Right. No, I, f I fully agree. And uh, maybe yet another point that I mentioned uh, that you might have missed is that uh, I think creating, um, you know, uh, legal ways for uh, migrants entering Europe should be yet another priority because uh, it, it's not only good for the for the migrants and and their families, uh, but it should be also desirable for Europe and the challenges it will fail. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it will face in the future, such as the aging population. So, uh, creating um, you know um, legal avenues for entering European Union and uh, facilitating migrants' in integration is also something we should strive yeah. for. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. But I I, I think that. Um... You know, we need to think about this, uh, and and what what I think the big issue is that we often, as development and humanitarians and the international, we try to look at what it was in terms of the past, and what I think we need to do is is project and look at what is it going to look like in a three to four degree rise. What is it going to look like uh, in terms of a doubling in population, and then I think what we need to do is from there really model out um, what we need to do because I think that's what we we don't do enough of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I also absolutely agree. And here we come full circle because this is exactly what our scientists do at the Potsdam Institute. So they model, they look ahead and they then advise on how to adapt accordingly. We are now already at the end of this very insightful and important conversation. We learned a lot about your work, about people needing to flee their homes because of climate change which is a huge driver of migration and displacement, how this then leads to further risks, but also might offer opportunities. So there's a huge amount of work to do. Let's just quickly look ahead now and see what are you looking forward to during the next month within your area of work? I would like to mention that I think it's very important to improve the understanding of the conditions under which climate change has already affected conflicts and its drivers and therefore could have an influence in the future. So I think that historical analysis are um, important uh, to, as this information could, could sort of help decision makers to find entry points to mitigate or even avoid climate related peace and security risks in the future. But I also agree with what Chris suggested that it's all important to, to engage in future projections of uh, climate migration, of, of climate-related conflict, of, of additional pressures uh, that could evolve in the future. Both historical and future analysis could um, improve our learning experience in a very, very fruitful way. And um, I think also um, combining approaches um, such as, uh, you know, hardcore data analysis uh, and, and field research to, to better understand what is actually happening is also key. And um, I think that's why I'm so happy to be engaged in, in the Veteran Risk Initiative, because it draws on all of these different perspectives. And um, uh, and soon enough, this year in the first quarter, uh, there will be a report on uh, a case study on Mali coming out uh, from the Veteran Risk Initiative. Maybe that's, that, that's where I would like to conclude. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it's incredibly um challenging uh i think that i have massive ups and downs days i think that there is as you said there's huge amounts of work to do and there's only sort of me focusing on this but i think that i think that what what we what i i'm you know quite a glass half full type person and quite positive on the fact that we can do this and if i see what we did in the Chevelle river on the flooding and i i feel like we've now mapped out all the critical water points for um, the drought side and we can really make a difference on that as well as then really you know build um, a sense of protection and understanding and knowledge in the young population around environmental protection as well as invest in this rewilding regeneration as well as investing in urban um, urban resilience and green jobs and green growth for con economic changes I think we can do it. I think that there is a possibility to do it. So I think the first sort of steps that I've been doing is really mainstreaming it and getting people to think about it, setting out those projections of 2080 to, to 2100. And so people know about that. And now and people are starting to think about that. 
we're trialing you know programs around displacement we're trialing things about mediation we're trialing things around you know green growth jobs alternative energy approaches we're looking at urban resilience from a green growth perspective so there is a shift happening and that's what it'll you know behaviors take a long time to change and specifically in donors and you know implementation agencies but also in communities so that 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 is happening and it was it's just going to take a while but i think that you know we really need to resource it we need to really everybody working on it and we need to realize that it is a an emergency that's happening as well as focusing on the advocacy of the diplomacy that you know telling countries like who are the biggest polluters that they really need to do this because unless they do this there is international security risks linked to that as well you've been listening to Sustainability, the Potsdam Dialogues, science for a safe tomorrow.